Greetings Guardians, my name is Bife here. So when we reach Niamuna we learn about the Cloud Striders and in particular the two that are currently serving. We also learned that there are only ever two Cloud Striders at any one time. At the point at which we arrive on Niamuna of course, we have Nimbus and we have Rohan. But who came before Rohan, given that he is the elder of the two Cloud Striders? Or rather, was. Today we're going to be learning about his mentor, his predecessor, her story, and what it is like when a Cloud Strider dies under normal circumstances, as opposed to having a more heroic and dramatic end, such as Rohan's. Her name was Tramatain. It's not clear if that was a call sign or if that actually was her name, but Tramatain does actually mean something. To be more specific about it, it means one who lives on the other side of the mountain, if a quick Google search is to be believed. It's unknown what greater legacy she had, but there are some moments at which she is mentioned by Rohan in his story, and her influence on his decisions undoubtedly led him to some of the greatest moments of his story. Her tales do actually give us some insight into what the end of a Cloud Strider's life looks like under those more normal circumstances, but we'll talk about that closer to the end of the video. For now, I want to talk about a decision of hers that's mentioned in the Deterministic Chaos Law tab, which is predominantly to post Rohan on the border between the Vex network and the Cloud Arc. This is something that led Rohan into close contact with the Vex, and then, as a result, into close contact with the Black Garden. This is something worth reading about, and it can be found in the lore of the deterministic Chaos Law entry, which reads as follows. He is fleeing the Vex across a verdant cliff. He is standing guard on the Cloud Arc Nexus border on Tramatane's orders. He is sitting next to Nimbus on the Watchtower ledge. He is trying to find a way out of this Daedal maze, he is trying to make sense of what he's looking at. He is trying to place the familiar voice echoing across the network. Would you like to dance? His foot crosses the quantum threshold before he's aware of it. His grip slackens and his gun falls into a bed of flowers. His stomach churns with fear, regret, sudden doubt as to what he is witnessing. The birth of a god, a false idol, a reproduction that is both like the veil and not at all, built up by the same Vex who bowed down to it. He is racing for the door that is at once opening and closing. He is coming around to the city council's decision to ignore the unknown threat. He is reaching for an answer to Nimbus's question. Do you think you'll have any regrets? He stares into the white hot glow of a conflux speculating on the secrets that lie within. He squints down the barrel of his gun at a row of glowing red eyes advancing on his city. He looks away from Nimbus's keen, curious expression to reckon with his uncertain certainty before he says, I don't know. You'll note that I've only read half the lore of that lore tab, and that's because it's not clear who the other perspective is. It seems that the part that I've read is clearly Rohan's, but again, there's a few different people that that other perspective could be. Back in the lore video I made for Deterministic Chaos, I stated that it might be Nezarek, but I feel like that's a lot less likely now that we understand how Nezarek's dialogue on Neomuna was triggered. It turns out that it's triggered really easily, just by walking into the areas that are required to enter for the sake of the Deterministic Chaos quest, and this was clearly Bungie's attempt to make us aware of Nezarek before the raid. The voice saying, would you like to dance, is something we have more context on, and that is the voice of Maya Sundaresh, or rather, one of the many copies of Maya Sundaresh that the Ishtar Collective released into the Vex network in order to explore it and better understand it. That is, of course, something that happened very long ago in the lore, and the version of her that finally did make it to Neptune is the original version. All of that being said, it's still not completely clear who this is. There are many personalities lost in the Vex network, and the only thing that seems much more clear is that this is probably not Nezarek. There were some overlaps, but I think that's worth clarifying, especially with the 2020 vision of hindsight. However, all of that is an aside to it. 
And the important takeaway from all of this is Rohan's side of the story. He was under Tramontaine's orders to defend the city from an ever-increasing Vex threat. More importantly, this led Rohan to his discoveries within the Black Garden, as he was placed on the edge of the Vex network and the Cloud Arc systems. This is something that the Cloud Strider Blue Jay learned to jump between, and using that same knowledge, it's clear that Rohan has been able to jump further, even into the Black Garden itself, where we discover deterministic chaos. Of course, what Rohan saw there was very much worth investigating, even if the city council decided to ignore the threat at the time being. It would turn out that that threat would be the heart of the Black Garden, and it was his mentor's orders that effectively led him there. It's impossible to speculate what Tramontaine's ideas on all of this were. It could merely have been that she was trying to ensure the defense of the city. But for all we know, she might have had some kind of agenda when it came to the Vex. Perhaps she was hoping that her younger, more enthusiastic protege would jump to and do a little bit of exploration all on his own. And lo and behold, that seems to be what has happened. Although that is purely speculative and there is nothing in game to back that up. So take all of what I've just said with a pinch of salt. Regardless, that was near the beginning of Rohan's career. And by the middle of his career, before Nimbus was elevated to the rank of Cloud Strider, it was Tramontaine's time to pass on. This moment is one that's quite unknown to us. For all the honor of a Cloud Strider's pledge, their end isn't one that always happens in the glory of battle. In more normal times, their lives end with a whimper, and then with silence. This is a story told to us of Tramontaine's last moments from Rohan's perspective. It's told in the Titan exotic known as a Bayant Leap, and it reads as follows. What Rohan wants to remember more than anything is her laugh. That booming, firmament-shaking, bone-rattling laugh. It rings out now as she leans down to deposit her core into the chief archivist's hands. Nothing discourages Cloud Strider Tramontaine from laughing at her own retirement ceremony. Not the chief archivist's attempts to hush her, and not the way her breath rasps in her chest afterwards. The chief archivist slots Tramontaine's core into the plinth. Nanites swarm up from the core, layering themselves systematically into the shape of her monument. The attendees burst into thunderous applause. That moment is suspended in Rohan's memory. Tramontaine, larger than life, head thrown back in laughter in front of her own memorial. But so too is this. Tramontaine, cradled in a nest of wires and tubing. As her implants break down, her body follows suit, each failure cascading into the next. She is withering to nothing in front of his eyes. There is no crowd here. Rohan's only companion in his vigil is a single puka, hovering over his shoulder. The doctors overseeing her palliative care duck in and out without a word. Rohan listens to the beeping monitors and hissing machines pumping blood through a faltering heart. But the room is unnaturally quiet. Tramontaine had stopped laughing when her lungs would no longer inflate on their own. Her hand, shriveled to bone, is barely strong enough to twitch. Rohan takes it in his own and leans close. If she mouths words, he can still make them out by the shape of her breath. But at the end, there is only silence. This is the fate of all Cloud Striders. Death at the end of ten years of service, after enhancement to the point where they can challenge even minor paracausal beings, just like Rohan and Nimbus did in the Time of the Lightful campaign. We know that they killed at least one Tormentor, and that's no small feat. They are, however, by the end of things, as they are retired and as their bodies begin to fail, reduced to but a fraction of their selves, having given everything in service to a people. I've talked about how the history of Neomuna is filled with revisionism, but there is one thing that the Neomuna's kids program does do correctly. It reminds us that we need to remember our heroes. Cloud Striders have a very ignoble end. It's not pleasant, it's not courageous, and it's also not really worthy of someone who's given their life to defend people. 
It's dying on an operating table. It's dying without any use of your body. It is dying having literally given all that you are. Revisionism or no, all of Neomuna knows that truth. The Cloud Striders aren't shuttled away out of public eyesight after ten years and given some metaphorical farm that they retire to. The truth of a Cloud Strider's fate is made public to all people in Neomuna, if the state of it is perhaps kept a little quieter. And so, that's something that perhaps we should do, both in game and in real life. Remember the heroes and what they've given for us. Because ultimately, their ends may not be so noble, kind of in the way that Tramontaine's wasn't. At the end of everything, after a life of service, there was nothing but a whimper. And that is a sad way to go. But that's all from me for today. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like and leave your own thoughts down below in the comments section. Of course, if you want more Destiny lore videos, you can hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. This is, uh, wow, this is getting to the point in the season where we're really rushing through topics and getting stuff done. I'm very pleased that we've been able to keep pace thus far. I will do my best to make sure we continue pace through May and onwards to the season of the deep. All that being said though, thank you for the continuous support and thank you for still being around. I know that Lightfall has dropped off just a little bit, but even so, it's nice to know that people are still enjoying the lore content. All of that being said, know that as per usual, your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Perodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside. <laughs>